I see Gary there too. Gary. Can yes, you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, John. You'll probably see more of it tonight, but Gary, we got a superb scope. You got sorry? We got a very good scope telescope. Well, we do. Did you take a picture? We took a bunch of pictures. Uh, look on your uh, on the uh, observers uh, list if you're if you're on that. Look at the yep. web page, the, the email. If not, I'll just send you some. Yeah, please, please. It came out pretty well. Excellent, and that's not even aligned, huh? That's right. Wow, I'm very very happy about. That. There's a there's a bit of misalignment at the bottom right corner, but uh, I think it's just the uh, focuser may not be perfectly aligned. Good, 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 good. That's very good to hear. Are you going to show any pictures tonight about it? Yeah, I think you'll see some stuff tonight. Okay, good. Reg has got some stuff. I think you'll probably show it. Good, good. If he doesn't, I will. So I was just up in uh, sunny Kamloops for the weekend and I saw a very nice conjunction of Mars and the moon. Mm -hmm. Yes. They can't two very degrees. Two degrees from each other. Yeah, less than two. I see Luca's uh, joined us, so well, welcome Luca. Looking forward to your talk this evening. Thanks very much. Congratulations, Hi, all. by the way. Thank you. Hey, Dave. I'll just mute myself until uh, when you have something to say. So it's interesting, all the Mars chatter going on in the group. In the Sierra Vista Club that I also belong to, it's the very same story. It's all Mars, 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 Mars. And it's quite fun to watch everybody doing their thing. But I must say, John, out of all the pictures, yours are the best. Oh, well, that's yes, nice indeed. to hear. Yes. Hi, Diane. Hi. Are you Mars observers out there? Hi, Diane. Hi, John. Congratulations on all your hard work. Thank you. Hi, Luca. Hi, Reg. Hey, Reg. How's it going? Not too bad. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. But he's so quiet tonight. It's unusual. Yeah. It's unusual. Lucas intimidating us. We're being on our best behavior, I think. He oh, what, because Lucas here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Normal, we're, we're rather rowdy, right? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, be yourselves. Yeah. Um, Reg, did you see that uh, email from Lori wanting to uh, announce something, some things? Yeah, well, we've got uh, the way we're we're going to go through the standard uh, monthly meeting thing, and we sure. have an opportunity to give uh, talks. And so I thought, when uh, Sid and Lori's turn about the school programs come up, she could um, promote the FDAO thing then, and maybe mention other things. So sounds good. Oh, could I have some time to talk about? Uh, Electronically assisted astronomy. Well, we'll see. Uh, see, uh, maybe after uh, uh, towards the end, I think we'll see how things go here. So. Yep, it won't take very long. I also have one point to make. Probably I will do it along with my telescope school program. Very good. Mike, we saw a red-breasted sapsucker at Swan Lake on Sunday. 
Mm -hmm. Of course you did, just because I wasn't there. I know. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well. Definitely deceased. Never it's, mind. Oh. I saw, sorry. It's uh, a. It hit, uh, it hit a window. Uh, it hit the window. It hit a window. That's rather a sad suck, suck, sucker if it hits a window. It is. Oh, yeah. I did see a red crossbill hair up at uh, uh, Quadra Island. And oh, a whole bunch of stuff that we don't see down here. There were about a dozen harlequins on the beach every day. So, hmm. Lovely. Where were you up at Quadra Island? Uh, we rented a B&B &B on the south end of the island, looking east uh, towards Cortez. Oh, really? Uh, uh, what road were you on? We go down Smith Road till it becomes something else. Yeah, um, Wawaki Beach Road. My family's had a cabin on that road for the last 50 years. Well, there you go. There you go. So I know where you were. Every time I drove down that road, I'd have to avoid your family's cabin if you had it on the road. <laughs> Yeah, was, uh, I hope they were waving back at you. Yeah, right. So, Mike, did you see some brat geese while you were up there? Speaking of birds. I did not. Speaking uh, of birds. No, no, no brants. Um, let's see. We didn't see too much rare uh, in any way, shape, or form. But we had whales all the time. They yep. were just kind of cruising back and forth, making noise. Yeah, and I had a beautiful view of... Uh, of uh, moonrise um, on the second day when Mars was real sh really close and I sent a <coughs> quick pick to Reg there but probably too late to do anything with it other than hit delete but speaking of birds uh, we went out to East Souk Park yesterday and uh, saw a couple of hundred uh, uh, turkey vultures doing their thing getting ready to cross the street <laughs> it was pretty yeah. impressive they, they try to get their nerve up until they finally all go at the same time. Yeah, once there's a big enough flock of them, then they just take off and away they all go. I guess yeah. it must be waiting for thermals or something, huh? To get across? Yeah, I think it's weather related and of course wind related too. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're waiting for their COVID test to come back. <laughs> Could be there a long time. <laughs> That's exactly. Isn't that, isn't that avian flu? Something like that. <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah, that was was good. Yeah, apparently, apparently, there were 1,200 of them at Rocky Point the day before. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. A lot of ugly birds. <laughs> yeah, they are really are homely things. Oh my However, God. they are beautiful flyers. I used to fly sailplanes, and watching them fly yeah, is a work of art. It's a work of art watching these ugly birds yeah. fly. My goodness, man. I have a, a large. Yes, there were a couple of. Red, sorry. There were a couple of red-tailed hawks and uh, a couple of bald eagles mixed in with them as well. Yeah. Hey. Beautiful to fly. Watch flying. Okay, I think we got a pretty good crowd here. We have 25 and probably a few more will join us later. So I think we should bring the meeting to order. Uh, Chris, can I uh, try sharing the screen? Sure, please go ahead. Should let you, I hope. Oh. So uh, what I'm gonna do is, this is a little bit different from our normal uh, Astro Cafe in that we're, we used to normally have a monthly meeting on Wednesdays nights, but we decided uh, we would, do, since we're having four uh, Astro Cafes, um, we will just uh, carry on and hold our monthly meeting on one of our regular uh, uh, Monday afternoons or uh, evenings instead. And so, um, it's a little bit different and we'll, we'll see, see how things go here. 
I'm having trouble with my screen right now, but we'll press on. Can anybody see anything up there? Looks fine. Yeah, we see the slide, the welcome to all meeting. Yeah, we see so, the crest, that's all. All right, so okay for, well, welcome everybody. And uh, our special uh, guest, uh, Luca from Edmonton. Um, so we're gonna start off with some announcements and then our guest speaker, Luca, is gonna talk and then we might have time to go to the Virtual Astro Cafe web summary. And uh, if uh, someone else wanted to share some thoughts on um, electronically um, uh, uh, shared uh, astronomy, we can do that. So uh, let's just go. So uh, before we do anything, this guest speaker, took this fabulous picture, absolutely fabulous. And Luke is gonna, I hope he's gonna share some secrets of how he did this. Uh, it's a real testament. Uh, it must have uh, required a tremendous amount of effort to do it, but we'll, we'll get there uh, later. So um, uh, for first of all, the announcements as the uh, president, uh, I have some breaking news here. Um, as you know, uh, we put a new telescope on the mount at the VCO and we now have limited access to it. And so on Saturday night, uh, you can see uh, uh, John McDonald and um, Joe Carr uh, at the scope. And you can also see we, we to uh, um, water uh, to uh, control your expectation. Uh, we have a kind of a Bakshi focuser on her. It's not the best thing, but it's the uh, optical guidance system, 12.5 inch Ritchie Crechin telescope, uh, got an F ratio of 8.6. And um, it is uh, a scope that's quite old, but uh, uh, we took some uh, pictures with it to test it. So this is the first light from it. And uh, the John took this picture with uh, a 30 second exposure at ISO 4000. And uh, John, did you want to say anything about these pictures as I show them? No, you go ahead, Rich. Um, so uh, basically the pictures look uh, pretty good up in one corner, but uh, other corners are a little bit distorted. So uh, this, there are a number of reasons that this might occur our focuser might not be completely coaxial with the uh, telescope, or maybe it needs a, a tweak of collimation or something like that. But I did not know what really to expect. And I was absolutely delighted by the quality of the images we got because uh, this telescope took a long and bumpy ride down the, uh, uh, from the Dragoon Mountain Ranch in Arizona uh, uh, by the kindness of, uh, of Gary Sedan, and um, so we're really quite excited about it. And here's a picture of the Ring Nebula as well. This is uh, taken at ISO 2500 by John's camera. Very here's good, John. Here. So, uh, uh, any any thoughts on that, Gary? This is the first. I don't know if you've seen this yet. Uh, no, I haven't. These yeah. thought, uh, you know, for a scope that's been bounced around as much and not collimated for years, this is stunning. Like the stars look very good. Yeah. I'm very, very pleased about this. Yeah. Like, very good, you guys. Very good. Congratulations. Yeah. We'll, we'll see what goes on forward. So that, that is our breaking news for tonight, first light. And we're kind of uh, encouraged. Um, one of the problems we have with this focuser is that uh, if we put a diagonal in there, we cannot bring an eyepiece. You hear it? So it would be a real major problem for visual observing if you're looking at the zenith. Uh, They're talking about the VCO scope. Yeah. So um, at any rate, uh, there there we are. Uh, we've uh, it looks like we're close to being back in business in a limited form at the Victoria Center Observatory. So kind of exciting news there. And if white people do want to do uh, a visual work, we of course still have the 20 inch uh, Obsession Dobsonian available to roll out on the pad. So there you go. So uh, the vice president hasn't much to say. Uh, the second vice president, I wonder if Margie, do you have anything to contribute Margie? I have nothing salient to say. 
Okay. Um, is Bruce, our Sky News editor there? I don't think so. Uh, Deb is getting her computer uh, repaired today, so she couldn't join us. But the balance uh, uh, for of our funds right now is $9,591.69. And uh, Chris, have you got any report for membership? Uh, we've got uh, 247 members at the moment, um, but 22 are in the grace period. So I will be uh, reaching out to some, some of those uh, people who have been around for a while and see if it just slipped their minds. I, I think I'm in that period too, so you better pound on my door. Okay. <laughs> I'm one of those grace period. <laughs> okay. Difficulty uh, on their website. Yes, um, uh, there. I think they said um, on that meeting yesterday the new um, membership site should be in place. They're hoping for January. I think that can't come till too soon. Uh, if you do experience problems trying to renew, uh, see if you can make contact with the national office. Um, that seems to work the best. I believe uh, Margie had to do that and others, I think. Well, I did twice last week and again today. I've not had much. No. We'll do it by mail. Yes, yeah, that's the other alternative. Do it the old fashioned way. Sid, did you try to get a hold of Adela? Yes, I did. I did the last week around uh, Wednesday. Oh, and she never got back to you? No. Then oh, again, yeah. I okay. Tried today. Sid, could you describe the nature of your problem? Are you trying to give them money and they're refusing? No, that's right. No one wants my money. <laughs> could I give it to you, Reg? No, I'm not to be. I'm not trustworthy. <laughs> so, uh, so okay. So we're we're at the point now where uh, the the school program, Sid uh, and Lori, have you any uh, new updates on that? I wish we had. We have not had any new connection with the schools, and we are trying to establish ourselves, um, Lori and I, what we want to do before we approach the schools. And most likely, we will, I think, uh, see, uh, these, uh, the CU and the uh, RASC will be combining together. And probably that's what we would like to approach, and we'll see how it goes. Okay. Yes, I, uh, we um. Oh, am I sorry? Uh, yeah, you're on. You were on, Lori. I'm on. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, the FDAO um, just uh, put out their uh, letter to the schools to to the beginning part of the schools um, today, and uh, saying that um, that the that the tours like are are the tours of the of the um, uh, center and the programs that we had uh, were going to be done by the um, by the staff at the FDAO, but that um, that we were the the Royal Astronomical Society will also be involved, so that Sid and I um, will be able to kind of sit in on some of those. We'll you know, we can do part of some of those programs um, uh, virtually and um, and so that so that's um, so that's kind of in the in the works so Sid I didn't get a chance it just went out today so sorry I didn't get a chance to show you first so oh, that's okay yeah, yeah. that's okay yeah. but well we'll be we'll be in we'll be um, invited into some of these for sure yes so will that be a dual branded thing uh, Lori uh, the sorry? FDAO will that be a branded thing uh, with both the FDAO and and RASC or, or yes or yes it's a yeah it has it has the uh, uh, our our logo is there along with the end like with with NSERC and and uh, the FDAO and and that kind of thing yeah so Great. we said you know two two organizations for the price of one you know <laughs> <laughs> what well, a deal that's great Lori you also were wanted to promote the FDAO um, star party and also maybe make comment about the uh, national workshop that you our uh, meeting yes. that you participated in. Um, this would be a good time to do that if you want. Okay. To do that. Um, so, 
Uh, yesterday we had a meeting um, that had 25 of the centers represented uh, by the education and public outreach um, uh, either either like a president or a representative of the center that came together to talk about um, what's happening at the centers in terms of some of the um, the meetings and the virtual star parties and what's been going on and we were thinking that this is the very first time that that's ever happened with the with the organization that um, that other people other than the national reps actually got together and 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 spoke so it was a great we had about 30 people online and um, and a, a pretty good pretty good discussion we got some good some some good new ideas and one of the things that came out was that uh, quite a few of the centers really wanted some training on how to set up um, how to set up like virtual live stream from uh, from um, uh, some of their telescopes or their observatories. Uh, some people already had that going, but other people really were interested in getting that. So the national, um, Jenna at national, national has said that that's something that they can really work on to get some training for the centers for people to be able to learn how to do that you know, well. And, and um, so that will be coming soon. And we're going to get a, a Google group together that will have um, these the the EPO representatives kind of combined in a working group so that we can all be uh, doing some communication and some um, and some sharing of resources that that kind of thing I think it was I think it was a, a good first first attempt at a meeting and in order to get um, things going so we were happy with that oh. actually that was a good meeting Lori oh thank you yeah it was a good meeting well done I can't um I was going to, I was, I have lost my, um, for some reason, I have lost my whole bottom bar of my Zoom and I cannot see anything about sharing my screen. Oh. It's completely lost. I have no idea where it is. I have no idea what's going on here. I've, I've, I'm in a very, very small little view and I can't get out of um, anything so okay, well, let you press, just... press the escape key oh okay nothing hmm. Hmm. okay do you know what I'm going to do um, uh, I think what I'll do is, is that let's just continue on and I will try to kind of come back in again into the meeting and go ahead with Luca and uh, and maybe I can give my other my other little bit at the end of the meeting okay thanks very much Lori um, uh, is Matt on for the Before you go to Matt, uh, may I make another announcement, Reg? Absolutely. Uh, I received a call from uh, Bill Amund's, uh, about Bill Amund's observatory, and he's offering his uh, dome. He cannot use his uh, observatory any longer, so he's offering his dome. It's a nine feet in diameter, so if anyone interested in starting their own uh, sites, they're most welcome to uh, get it. Wow, and I it, think a picture of that dome might be in the uh, history that he wrote of the 100th year history of the uh, Victoria Center, so. This could be, so there's another artifact yeah. for you to have in your backyard. <laughs> So how would you like uh, people to, if people have uh, uh, interest in that, I will, you like I will give you the phone number if uh, you, will not, you would like to record and uh, people call this number. Well, why don't we, uh, we send it out to the list? Uh, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, the Sky News list and then it won't be broadcast on the internet. Yeah, probably that's what I will do. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, that thanks for thanks for that, uh, Sid. Um, is um, Matt around? No. Well, website with Joe. I, I got to say that Joe uh, really did a great thing last week. He went up to the VCO twice, once to retrieve a computer, repair it, and then put it in. And we now have a functioning computer up there. I guess it died over the long winter COVID spell. So thanks very much for that effort, Joe. Much appreciated. Have you any uh, uh, other things to report? No, I don't think so. The uh, I think that was the 
report for the technical committee, the, the computer hosting our, uh, our mount and our observatory is working again. Um, I think basically it was just shut off for too long and froze up, no big deal. Um, but as far as the website's concerned, it's going along fine. Um, most of the content is now being uh, generated by this meeting, which is not a bad thing. At least we have some interactive media and all sorts of good stuff on there. Uh, the Facebook group continues to be uh, quite active as well. It's a mix of members and non-members. So um, things are working very well, actually. I'll leave it at that. Okay, very good. Um, Nelson is not able to make it tonight. Is Bill Weir on? Well, I guess we don't have a report from uh, National Council. Is Chris Gaynor around? Not tonight. So no, I think Bill and Chris are both on the road somewhere, have been. Yeah. Okay, well, that's the end of uh, that. Uh, uh, my thing there. So what I'm going to do is stop the share and we're back here. And um, now, uh, Luca, uh, you've got to realize that we have a key person from Edmonton that came here about, about five years ago and we call him the Edmonton secret agent. Uh, that's Dave Robinson. And he is well, basically taken over our, our center. On, we're, we're just learning it now. And uh, it's been a real win-win for us because he's introduced us to a, a lot of, well, first of all, he shared a lot of beautiful videos and stuff like that on the, the Astro Cafe. And then he's had some people join us and give presentations uh, like Alistair Lang and that. And, and so it's really been a positive thing. And uh, I, uh, uh, we really do appreciate his contribution. It's uh, been huge and we're really happy to see all of the stuff. And I must say, from all of the things that I've seen you guys doing out there, uh, I don't know what it is. Is it uh, the cold winters or the, uh, uh, something's going on? You seem to really have the right stuff and you're doing amazing stuff. So thank you so much for uh, agreeing to uh, uh, give your presentation. Uh, Dave, did you want to say any words as well? You're, you're not, you're, uh, you're muted. Not uh, not a whole lot. I've known Luca for a while. Uh, he's been pretty active in the in the center in Edmonton for quite some time. And uh, he and Alistair are, are buddies that uh, collaborate and scheme on getting a whole lot of very interesting uh, astro astronomical shots that include the foregrounds and backgrounds of the city that they live in. Uh, and and this most recent one where he. Uh, he got his photo on APOD is a typical example of the stuff that he and Alistair are capable of. So, Luca, take it away. Well, thanks very much, Dave, and uh, thanks for the kind words, Reg. And uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, present uh, to you at this, uh, what I thought was an Astro Cafe, but I see now it's a little bit of a modified format. But I'm really honored to be able to present the latest work uh, to you fine folks. I have a PowerPoint to show, so I should have, I'll have to share my screen. I can do that from here? Should be able to, yes. I got the power? Okay. I will uh, share the screen. Okay. Everybody can see the title slide? Yeah, looks good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, well, and I guess just a, a couple, uh, as um, Dave mentioned, I've been involved with RASC Edmonton for quite a number of years, uh, and I've been through all of the various uh, uh, council positions. And um, my current role in RASC is um, is casino chair, and uh, as well as I'm on the team for the Black Nugget Lake Observatory project, which is now was to have near was to have uh, been completed. Um, 
by the last month uh, with first light and uh, but a series of events caused uh, delays and the cancellation of the star party didn't actually help uh, due to covid so everything's uh, been uh, delayed and postponed until september 2021 where our team will be unveiling the 32 inch telescope at black nugget lake about 45 minutes southeast of edmonton so that's my that's what fills most of my rast time uh, these days but when I have a camera and it's and uh, it's not and the moon's around or the sun's around and it's not new moon, I typically go out and try to take uh, uh, skyscape type images. And as Dave mentioned, uh, Alistair Ling and I have been doing that for a few um, for a few years now. So tonight I'm going to I'd like to talk to you about uh, my latest uh, image, which I called uh, Sunset Azimuth Sweep. Uh, a project that took from December 2019 to June uh, of this year. And so this is the image uh, as, uh, as finally composed. And I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the, uh, its genesis, the ideas behind it, some, uh, what, some of the previous work that led to, uh, to doing this one, um, the, the equipment I use, uh, the, uh, the planning, uh, for the, the picture itself, the execution to, go, to gather the, uh, the images required for it. And then uh, the last bit will be about how I constructed this uh, composite uh, image. Uh, actually, in truth be told, a composite of composite images uh, because uh, this, these, are just, these are not just single day events. So for the longest time, I've been interested in uh, what I call skyscape images. And skyscape is a relatively uh, newish term, but it's basically come to mean uh, an image that combines an astronomical object or sometimes multiple objects and the landscape, right? If you combine those two together, then generally we, we've been calling those skyscapes. Uh, and in fact, in the RASC Astro Imaging Certificate Program, the wide field category, that's essentially uh, uh, most of the requirement of that is is wide field type skyscape images. If you if you care to uh, go for that certificate, uh, but some of them uh, are more dynamic uh, in 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 the sense that they illustrate uh, the passage of time. And in the ones that I've been doing for a long time, they actually illustrate the dynamics of the of the Sun Earth system. There's uh, three of the previous uh, pictures uh, that uh, I produced, and I'll just talk briefly a little bit about them. The first one was uh, was one of the harder ones to do, which took, which because it takes a long time to do it, and that's really the uh, the um, the time scale of one year, and that was to capture the solar analemma. Uh, people have been doing these uh, since the film days, all started by Dennis DeChico at uh, Sky and Telescope, and I'd always been fascinated by it, trying to capture it on a single piece of film, and it was a four-year, even though it's a one-year in theory to execute this, it took me four years to do it because the first three years the film-based approaches kept failing. It was my last film-based project. And so in the fourth year, I also did one digitally at the same, as, uh, at the same time as film. And this was result. And so it's illustrating the, uh, the shift of the sun's position at the same time each day. If you were to stand and look at the sun at the same time of uh, clock time of day throughout the year, um, you would observe its position to, uh, to move in the shape of this figure eight called the analemma. And so if you, over the course of a year, if you can take a, such a picture every week or so, um, and then you combine it with the foreground image, uh, then you can produce an image like this. Um, the, even though there is a, it's dynamic in showing the pos shifting position of, of the sun at a fixed clock time, um, the image itself is really showing a single day uh, uh, that I selected. In this case, I selected a summer view. And so the dynamics here are the axial tilt for the, uh, the uh, altitude of the sun changing throughout the year and then the elliptical orbit uh, and the difference between clock time and solar time, which is essentially a graphical illustration of the equation of time. So that was the, that was the very first one that I ever did uh, of this nature. Uh, sometime later in, in the back half of 2017, I did the predecessor of the sunset picture, which was called the sunrise azimuth sweep. This type of picture takes six months to do to illustrate the movement of the sunrise position uh, between solst uh, from sol summer solstice to winter solstice. And at the time I had just done a plan, a simple one. I was gonna do it in June um, and then September uh, and December. 
And so you get, uh, you get a skyscape, but now from left to right, which is the way I shot it, uh, you see the passage of time from, uh, from June to December. Um, you don't really need to do this over a whole year because starting in December, if you look at it from right to left, you would see the passage of time uh, from winter solstice to summer solstice. So I did this one and in this one, of course, now I wanted to show how the changing landscape in Edmonton's River Valley changes between summer, fall and winter. And thus began the, uh, the process of learning how to blend, uh, blend images to create such a thing. And there are difficulties uh, that you encounter when trying to do the sky at the same time as the river valley. You get, you get the sky right, the river valley doesn't look doesn't look very good. If you get the river valley right, then the sky doesn't look very good, or you get a lot of banding, which doesn't look very natural. Even though this isn't really a natural scene, you can never see this at any instant in time, but over the course of the period, you would. So a lot of things were learned in that one. And it was, sat it was a satisfying picture, but I felt that it was, uh, over, as I, time went on, I felt it was a little bit, you know, there's a lot of space there between uh, June and September and between September and December. And it could be more to show. And then uh, about uh, the way the sunset or the sunrise and, and ultimately the sunset images or um, arcs change over time. So that one was done in, uh, back in 2017. And about a year later, I did another one. And now the duration is down to one day. So right around the time of the winter solstice, this, we get the lowest sun and it's in, in the, the shortest daylight hours. And or, you know, if you have a good vantage point, you could watch in the course of a day, the sun from sunrise to sunset. So it's a blend of some imagery from uh, the course of a single day uh, from a rooftop of a friend's apartment building looking uh, south towards the uh, fr across the river valley towards the uh, from da from uh, west downtown through the University of Alberta in, at the for uh, at the horizon there and so that was a uh, series of pictures with about um, ten minutes solar spacing across the day um, dealing with a bit of clouds towards sunset nothing too oh. nothing too bad it actually only eliminated one one uh, particular solar image. And then there's a combination of how are you going to show morning twilight or morning glow and evening glow and somehow bring in daylight, broad daylight in the moment in, in the um, in the view. So I included uh, an unfiltered picture in the middle just to show if you were to take a picture of the sun without a filter, just how much glare you would get uh, as opposed to just seeing the the circle of the sun. So that was a one day uh, a one day uh, elapsed time. The, the types of the techniques and the types of processing are very similar. So the course of these three over, over the years uh, taught me a lot of things, uh, made a lot of mistakes, had to do a lot of testing, a lot of trials, and a lot of, a lot of learning about how to, uh, how to blend these images. And so that leads me to the current picture, which is the sunset version of the azimuth sweep. And so I wanted to, again, illustrate the change in sunset position or azimuth from the summer to the winter solstice. Um, and, I, and I really wanted to demonstrate the several effects due to the Earth's axial tilt and elliptical orbit, right? So the way the azimuth changes across six months from perihelion to aphelion, right? The way the azimuth changes from month to month because it's not the same amount of change and also changes in angle and curvature of the sunset arcs. As you can kind of see that they're all, they're not all straight. Some are curved and they're not all curved the same way. The gaps aren't all the same. So I wanted to be able to illustrate all of that uh, in a single image. So you need, you need to, one of the first things you got to figure out to do is where can I do this from? How, how do I find a location where I can get enough horizon uh, and enough interesting landscape in front of me to be able to do this. And so these are ne this is uh, necessarily a very wide image because the azimuth range is 218 to 318, uh, especially when you take into account that you have, to take, uh, you have to take the sun, not just where it sets, but also where it is in the sky at the start of the sequence. So it's about 100 degrees wide, uh, the image. And so you really need a location with a very wide southwest and northwest view. And in Edmonton, on the banks of the North Saskatchewan, there's a, there's a nice park called Roland Park, um, very near um, McNally High School that has some nice benches. And if you look it up on uh, Google um, satellite view, you can see it there. And there's, you can see on the, on the left here, there's an image uh, showing approximately the view 
uh, of the image. So you can do a lot of the planning by just using Google uh, Map and Street uh, Satellite and Street View. But to really get serious about knowing how to frame the picture, so you make sure that you start with the with making sure that your frame will capture everything you need from start to finish, you really need some more accurate reference points. And so there's many tools to do this, but the one that I've been using for a number of years is called Photo Ephemeris. And this is available as a um, as a web-based app at the URL shown at the bottom of the screen. Um, there's a free version which incorpor incorporates open street map uh, and no satellite view, or if a uh, very uh, minor subscription fee for the year, you also get the incorporated uh, Google Maps, Google uh, and satellite terrain, as well as street, uh, as street view. And so it's a tool for planning uh, landscape photography involving the moon, the moon, the sun, or the golden hour, for example, right? Or twilights. And so you can pick your position, put the red pin down where you want to be and you uh, and pick a date and you uh, and you see the scene right away this you can see the blue lines uh, the light blue and the dark blue are the sun rise to sunset uh, azimuths the yellow and orange uh, sorry the yellow and orange lines are the sun and the light blue and dark blue are the moon you turn them on and off you get a time bar across the bottom it gives you all the pertinent data for the day uh, uh, moon rise and set times, sunrise and set times, golden hour, and then the start and end of the of the three twilights. And then you can also have there's a slider at the bottom, the blue line with the circle. You can move that around um, uh, to figure out exact, and you will get and you will find out where exactly the the sun position or the moon position will be uh, at a particular time of day in between the various times listed there. So you, I plunked this down, this pin at this location that I'd found on. Um, uh, on Google uh, Maps. And then in order to set the frame of this picture, you got to figure out, well, where exactly is this? If I go stand there and I look along the horizon, where's the sun going to be at the beginning, at the beginning of the sequence, which would be around the winter solstice in December. So you so you pick a date and put you pick the date, December 21st, sunsets at 415, and look and zoom in and pan down and looking at the orange line, you figure out where it's going to be, see if there's a landmark you can see. So I know that uh, from that park, you can see one of Edmonton's newest bridges. It's quite iconic looking and you can't mistake it. So you know exactly where it's going to be. And looked like on December 21st, 2019, that's where the sunset point will be pretty well right over that bridge. So then that kind of takes care of the left-hand side of the picture because we're going from December to June. And then change the date and look at June 21st, 2020. Now you'll see it happened to be around uh, very close to new moon. It was, in fact, that day was new moon at just after uh, midnight. Uh, so the uh, orange and dark blue line of the sun and moon set points are... Uh, are very are just one on top of the other, but you can see how far northwest uh, they are. And then if you zoom in and take a look at where that orange line is, it looks like it's cro it's going to cross, go across the river valley, across Jasper Avenue. And it looked like oh, there's some apartment buildings in there, but it, there's a gap. Hmm. There's a good chance maybe the sun might get uh, will set into that gap, might get covered by the building a little by the buildings, those red orange buildings a little bit, but it could. Uh, it could very it could very well set in that gap. So boded well for the two endpoints. So I know where I can go look to set the frame of the picture. So you could do that because uh, if you were standing on a street where Google Street View is available, you could then just like in Google, you can bring the uh, Street View indicator down and get the Street View automatically, and would give you a reference picture or an approximate reference picture right in the tool. Now I'm standing at a park near a bench on the river bank, and so the closest street imagery it was actually on the parking lot road at the high school. So I. It's a close times before. Well, it's saying my internet connection is unstable. Can people hear me? You're, yeah. you're breaking okay. up a bit. Pardon me? You're breaking up a bit. Uh, okay. How's it now? Seems to be back. Okay. Yeah. The little indicator that the internet was unstable went away. So this is just to give you an idea of what the tool can do. Uh, and so 
I can't get very close to where my pin is because I'm not usually uh, at a street, uh, but it, quite often you can be there. But you get a, you can just incorporate, it's got the Google Street View incorporated right away. And so you can see some of the landscape, uh, some of the, the, the foreground imagery uh, is showing those apartment buildings and the ones on the right, the orange one and the two creamy brown ones there. Uh, that's, where that, that's where that gap is that I could see on the satellite view. And the pin is approximately where the bench is on the other side, unfortunately on the other side of that spruce tree. But if it was a normal street view, you could actually get a rough picture right away to see if this uh, type of uh, location will meet the needs. But there's, of course, there's nothing like going out there and taking some pictures yourself. So about a week before well, I planned to start the project, I went out to the site and I took a test image uh, on December 14th, so about seven days before the 21st, and just before sunset. Here you get a lot of leeway um, that the, the, the change, the position of the sun is only one or two tenths every, for about a week from the max, from the southern most point. So if you can get a picture just before sunset, you can accurately see uh, where on the horizon it will be so that you know how you can set the left hand part of the frame. And the reason all of this is pretty important is that you want to minimize the number, how you, uh, the number of uh, camera aiming positions you're going to do, especially when you're going to do it over multiple visits and you don't have the luxury of leaving the tripod and the camera there for six months. If you had that luxury, you could simplify a lot of things. But this is in the field, and you deal with uh, things like snow and ice on your location, and you have to be and you have to be able. You, you can only really closely approximate your camera position. You can't nail it exactly like you might do on a, on a fixed mount. But that was close enough to make sure I could, as long as I had the left frame about where you see it, the sun should enter the frame on the left and set where the big glow is. So that was a test image. And then I took another series of images uh, using a 10 millimeter lens, wide angle, and I created this reference image. So here it is, so the reference image, using the photo ephemeris, I just, uh, and, and where on the horizon those sunset lines uh, occur, you can kind of nail down where on the horizon the sunset points will be. And you can see over on the right on June 21st, um, it showed that it might act the sunset point might be at that right at that apartment building, but it could be in the gap. It really depends well, where I set the camera down uh, because even even walking ten or fifteen twenty meters north just by walking, you can shift the position or by walking south. So I picked this because there was a nice bench nearby I could set all my equipment down and I could find that bench every time and uh, basically plunk the tripod down very closely to where I needed it to be. But this became the reference image, and I'm trying to get a picture across all of those dates uh, from this location, or a series of pictures. There's some close-ups at the bottom of the left, middle, and right uh, of this reference image. So that was always on my phone for reference purposes, and then calendar reminders reminding me that this is all coming up. You've got, of course, you look at the forecasts, and pick your days, and if it's coming up early, and you know you the twenty first of the month might be uh, this looks like it's going to be a washout. Go get the data early because once you have it, uh, you can afford to wait for the for the for the ideal date because if because if the weather doesn't cooperate and you don't get it, at least you have something from before. So I'm always uh, I'm always a few days leading into each of the target dates, always uh, paying close attention to forecasts. Um, uh, and cloud models to figure out uh, when I should take the time to go do it. Um, so the equipment, uh, I don't use very fancy equipment. Uh, everything I have is, uh, in terms of camera gear, is uh, stock Canon. In fact, getting kind of old Canon Rebel T3i is a camera that I've had for many, many, many years. Uh, and a 10 to 18 millimeter uh, zoom lens, which I used at 10 millimeters. Uh, for this, uh, for this project. An intervalometer so that you don't have to touch the camera while it takes the pictures. You, I use a physical one, but if anybody here shoots Canon, they know they can use a magic lantern and update the firmware and do it through that. Uh, but I just didn't bother with that for this one. I just used a standalone intervalometer to trigger the shutter. I made a solar filter for the lens out of beta solar filter material. And that's just uh, made by hand using cardboard uh, rings to go over the lens. 
uh, 12 volt battery. Some of the uh, some of these imaging runs are pretty long. It's pretty cold in the winter months, and the the camera, the internal camera batteries, you no, know, there was no way they were going to cut it. You now for sometimes uh, an hour or two hour shoot uh, out at minus uh, 20. So I used a 12 volt battery to power the camera, and Alistair Ling actually. Turns out he built a buck converter for me to convert the 12 volts to the camera's 8.4 volts. And now there's lots of power. I can bring in a power pack and I don't have to worry about running out of power at all. Because that's, that's, that's a bad thing in the middle of a three hour run. And I use a heavy duty tripod with a geared head and heavy duty tripods are always better. Th uh, the heavier the better because they're sturdier on the ground and they're, and they're less susceptible to uh, accidental movement. I also use a bigger 12 volt battery with a bungee cord as a weight to uh, increase the, the weight down onto the ground uh, for, the, for the camera setup. So here's a picture of the setup uh, in, uh, in warmer times. So there's the camera setup uh, in the winter on the bank um, with the big battery down. Here's another angle of it. You can clearly see the big battery weighing it down with the, uh, uh, with the bungee cord all set up and so this is what it looked like right around December 26th. So I took, I took my test imagery at December 14th and there was a run of bad weather uh, leading up to the 21st and so I didn't really get it till Boxing Day but it was still close enough uh, within two tenths uh, of the sunrise of the maximum of this most southerly sunset point. So it was, uh, that was the scene. Uh, these are a bunch of phone pictures because uh, while you're waiting uh, you just you got nothing to do but uh, just monitor. Here's the scene in April where the snow finally went and the river broke. So that was good to get some water in the river for the foreground image. Uh, everything else, of course, is still brown because we don't get summer here till August. So um, if you really want some greenery, you got to wait a while. Maybe not, maybe not August, but by June, of course, everything's green and the sun is setting out towards, uh, towards the north. Here it is, uh, I don't know, maybe half hour. Uh, before sunset, right around golden hour time, and I just snapped a picture. So this is the, basically the setup across uh, across the months. And so the shooting plan was to start on December 21, end on June 20th, to cover solstice to solstice, and try for every as close as possible to the 21st as possible. As I said before, the solstices give you the most leeway because the sun doesn't change position that much. There's a week or 10 days about around each uh, solstice where it only moves with a tenth or two tenths of a degree. But around the equinox time, in this, in, in, for this shoot, it was gonna be March, the sun is moving, right? That, that position is changing daily, about half a degree per day. So if you miss the, uh, if you miss the target date by a few, quite a few days, you, it, it, it does significantly impact uh, what the, Im the, the uh, image is trying to illustrate, but of course, weather rules in this regard, so there's nothing you can do. And so the chart below at the bottom there shows you, okay. this were the actual shooting dates that I was able to obtain. December 26th was one of the furthest ones away from the target, but otherwise I was able to get it within a day or two uh, of the target date. And I just, uh, just a table of the sunset times. You can see how they vary by several hours between June, uh, December and June, how the position of the sunset point changes by that huge number of degrees. The, the monthly change in uh, degrees per month, as you can see, that grows to March and then shrinks back to June, but it's not symmetrical. Um, and the last column shows how close I got it to the target. So I was... The furthest away I ever was was on April at uh, or a little early at 1.8 degrees from where I wanted to be. But all, all in all, given the weather and given some of the months that are notoriously cloudy around here, um, it actually worked out uh, quite well. So each month, you got to do this seven times. So each month, got to get two, got to get images for two things. The solar image composite, which is all the dots, uh, all those little circles of the sun showing the arc to sunset. And for that, they're filtered and I shoot every 10 seconds, and the plan was to shoot from about 24 degrees altitude right to sunset. Um, and of course, the first couple of months, the sun was never at that altitude, so it comes in on the side of the frame, but for the other months, it does come in from the top of the frame, and so I decided that I would use, I wanted about 24 degrees of sky and, the, and give the rest of the image uh, for foreground. Why shoot every 10 seconds? Well, 
you, uh, the process is for each solar arc is you, I want to be able to select the lowest solar image that I'm going to use. And so it's either going to be right above the horizon or possibly clipped by a building or right above a tree or something along the horizon. Didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but I wanted to be able to select the, the one I wanted to start with and then use five minute spacing uh, for the rest of them all the way up to the top or the left. And so if you shoot every 10 seconds, you can pick any starting, any starting picture you want, and then it's simple matter to select pictures every five minutes away. Plus, every 10 seconds, if you get clouds throughout the shoot and they start to hide the sun for a while, well, you can, and if, you don't, if the sun isn't covered up too much, you can uh, use something within uh, 30 seconds or 20 seconds, in, and, then, and then you won't really see much of a difference uh, in the spacing between the solar images. So I was shooting every 10 seconds. Lots of power, fast, you know, the big memory cards, these are quite easy to do these days. It doesn't cost very much money at all. Foreground composite is the second thing you need. You need some unfiltered pictures to be able to create the landscape. And so I needed a set of bracketed suns, uh, uh, post sunset foreground images. This is a sunset sequence, so it's not going to give an impression of daylight. Uh, it wants to, I want it to give the impression of the post sunset foreground in uh, basically a civil twilight scene. So I have to do this uh, for each month. So what are the camera settings? Well, I shoot in JPEG because raw has, to, uh, I just, raw is just overkill for what I need to do. Uh, big files takes longer, processing is longer, so I just shoot in JPEG. I keep the uh, ISO to uh, very, lo uh, very low, very very low to minimize noise, and also most of the things I'm shooting are bright by astronomical standards, and so don't need high ISO. You just fix the white balance, the daylight. I use the daylight because it's either the sun or the moon in most cases, and they either generate the light or reflect the sunlight. So use daylight white balance, but it's manually fixed so that it, the camera is not changing the white balance on you throughout the shoot because that's bad. And manual focus. Auto focus is not your friend on these things. It might be to get a rough focus, but once you nailed in the manual focus, you or the, the exact focus you want, you leave it on manual because... The camera has a tendency on autofocus to try and it'll start to wander if, if you, especially if there's a lot of sky in your photo and you uh, somehow don't have your focus points uh, set correctly. So manuals much better for that, uh, which with live view, you can manually adjust if necessary, if there's any kind of focus drift, which I happen to find uh, with temperature changes uh, during the cold shoot. So one of the things that I've added to my checklist daily uh, these past uh, year is, you know what, take the lens outside be for a couple hours before, not the camera, but the lens and pre-chill the lens is, does wonders, as you know, like with telescopes also does wonders for camera uh, focus drift, even on wide angle, uh, it makes a difference. So those are the general settings. There's the exposures every 10 seconds at F11 with the filter. When the sun's pretty high to about seven degrees, one, one over one, two, five is good enough. And then you have to start ramping because the, the, sun is, the sun is getting dimmer. So went to a hundredth of a second down to three and a half degrees. And then uh, basically ramping down from a 60th to a 15th from altitude 3.5 to sunset. And there's a little example of some solar arcs. You can see that the brightness and the color changes as the sun sets. And then the post for sunset foreground is, is a standard bracket for any landscape. I just opened up, took the filter off, opened up the iris at 6.3, and I did that soon after sunset. Generally in, in the uh, civil twilight time is when I did those. And there's a, there's a shot of the camera uh, uh, bracketing uh, at one of the, uh, I think it was March uh, sequence. And so building the final image, this is where I'm going to spend the rest of the talk is about how to build the final image from the types of images that are collected. So we need some foreground composites um, and I will get up to seven of those because there were seven shooting periods. For each of those, I will need a solar image composite, which is, uh, which again, I said, you, you uh, start by selecting a solar image using uh, selecting them at five minute spacing and then doing layer, layering and light and blend to produce the, the thing you see on the right middle 
right? The foreground, I should have mentioned the foreground composites, the standard, the standard technique is layer mask and gradient for blending. Uh, one could do this kind of thing with uh, high dynamic range techniques, uh, but I found that I often don't like the results. And since the uh, layer masks and gradients work if very effectively, especially with things with a nice straight horizon across your portal, um, you don't have to get into the vagaries of uh, HDR. So you've got a bunch of foreground composites, up to seven. You have to have seven solar image composites because that's the point of the picture. Um, and uh, the final image composite, you build it out of all those things. And I'll talk about it in a minute. I wanted to go with three foregrounds for the sky, a slightly different set for the valley, the seven solar composites, and merge everything via alignment and gradient blending. The alignments are necessary because, as I mentioned, the camera's position isn't absolutely the same uh, or the aiming isn't exactly the same so there are slight variations in aiming in aiming and so you have to move layers around a little bit to get everything registered something a registax would do for you or auto stackert for your planetary imagers but i do it manually for these because there aren't that many to do um, and uh, i don't think those other programs could nece would necessarily handle it so how do I do everything? Well, as many options you can use. I've been using the GIMP for many, many years. And the best, and so GIMP is powerful. Just, I think over the years, I've, I think I figured out that anything you can do in Photoshop, you can do in GIMP. And so I never chose to spend the money. And uh, because, and the best thing about GIMP is that it's free and it's uh, open source. There's a very robust set of development on it. There are forums and plugins developed for many, many techniques, uh, and it's a, it's a great environment. So I do everything in, in, in this, but the things I'll show you uh, are pretty standard in any uh, photo processing uh, tools. So we want to build a foreground composite. So here's an example of what happened on uh, December 26 last year. This is the uh, picture I chose uh, post sunset. Uh, for exposed for the sky. Get the nice glow on the left, and there's this, you notice there's a sky gradient going from light to dark. But you can't see much in the valley because it's exposed for the sky. My eye could see the valley like you see below because our eyes naturally do HDR. We, our eyes are, have high dynamic range compared to these cameras. But now the sky's blown out. So what I need is a combination of the two uh, with a blend uh, to create this foreground composite. And this is one of seven uh, that I would use, that I would have available to use uh, by the end of the project. So you uh, do you shoot all shoot all these pictures, but uh, build all these things as you go because you want to be able to uh, to see how the image is progressing uh, month to month. And so these are the solar images uh, that I captured and layered uh, together uh, for the uh, the solar image. So I'll need this I'll need this image with a black background to bring in later, but month to month, I could also create, this is a standalone skyscape of the scene of the sunset on December 21st, right? Coming in from the left and setting. So we need about, so I ended up being able to produce seven of these as the months were on. So we'll just take a quick tour through them. Here's uh, January, right? So got, got all the sun, but there was clouds moving in towards us. So that by the time I was able to, um, some of the some of the solar images aren't full discs. If you if you were to look closely at this arc, you'll see that some of the discs are occluded uh, by some intervening clouds that kept moving through the scene. But I was able to get most of it, so I didn't I didn't go back a different day. Um, but in post sunset, a lot of cloud in the sky. Probably would not be able to use this for the final uh, picture. Well, still lots of snow on the ground. This is a common theme for the next couple months. Here's the uh, February. Uh, Composite image. There's the arc still coming in off the side. Very nice sky. Notice the sky glow now in the post sunset is now starting to extend from the left towards the, the middle, right? Foreground. Hardly, un, hardly, you wouldn't, you couldn't tell this apart other than the, the, the glow of the sky from a January or December uh, landscape scene. This is Edmonton, looks like this for a long, long time in winter. March, getting better. Snow is starting to dissipate, but that river is still frozen, still covered. Not going to get anything in there. There's the arc. Now it's coming in from the top. You notice I don't have it all the way to the top. That's because the top left solar images 
above 24 degrees. I don't need anything higher. So I didn't, I didn't always start because some of these shoes were getting longer and longer and I didn't want to be out at that park for, uh, for uh, in increasing number of hours every time. But this was enough for the eventual one. The foreground starting to lose a bunch of snow, but that river valley is solid. So here we are in April, finally there's a change. Most of the snow is gone. The river on that particular date happened to break up as I was shooting. And so the water cleared, it was very, but it was, uh, the ice cleared away. The water was still very still. Gorgeous reflections of the opposite trees on the water in the middle, as well as you can see the one and only time across these months where I got some solar reflections off the river as well as part of the April uh, sunset. So this one was very good. You'll notice the sky glow on the right now is extending all the way to the Northwest. And so if I got no more usable post sunset skies, this, the sky in this one could be the stand in for the spring and summer because the glow was there. Uh, and the left-hand side doesn't have any more glow, but we already, we already got that from the winter scenes. There's May. A few, uh, finally some green, all the ice and snow is gone, and uh, a few clouds in the post sunset, including one little pesky one there, um, but quite usable. Now the glow is all the way over. And here's the June uh, sequence, um, when now we finally get good green uh, for, the land, for, for the close foreground. I notice, if you notice, there's two dates on this, June 18th and 20th. June is problematic, uh, can be rainier, can be cloudier, and I could not get all the data on a single day in that period. There was, I think there was actually one day where I could, but I had other commitments that I could not break, and so I had to split it uh, between the 18th and the 20th because of things like this. This is how the 18th started at the shoot. Lots of cloud in the sky, but it was moving quickly and it had variable thickness. And you can get usable solar images through the clouds if they're not too thick. So I was able to get a, quite, you know, I, was, I thought this wasn't gonna work very well, but as it kept going, the shoot ended like this. So it did finally clear off. So I got the majority uh, of, the, uh, of what I needed on that date. And as you can see, the sun is setting in that gap on the rightmost buildings. And it wasn't actually closer to the um, to the right building. It was actually closer to the left building in that gap. But it was good enough. There was going to be a solar image there at the end. So this was been usable, but I didn't have the top end. So then I went back a couple of days later. Started out like that. Also not very promising. Um, but there were gaps in these clouds that allowed me to get the top end of the arc. And again, we're near the solstice, so we're within a. Across these two days, we're within uh, one tenth of a degree of the arc, so very, very close to be able to produce a, a faithful representation you know, of, the sun, of the sunset arc. And it ended like that. So the bottom half, no way. I couldn't get anything once that long cloud rolled in, and I couldn't get anything all the way down to the horizon. But I had the stuff I needed from June uh, 18th. And on this date, all the while behind me, you haven't seen behind me. In in the camera. This is what the sky looked like for most of it. So everything was happening in front of me, but behind me was beautiful usable sky. But sometimes you just don't get it. So we're going to build the final image. Uh, got my seven solar composite images. We've got the three foregrounds to represent winter, spring, and summer because those are the seasons of this time, uh, of this time frame. And as I said, I chose slightly different options between sky and valley. And the basic steps are there. You, uh, step one is to create a sky panorama uh, of just dealing with the sky itself. Then use that same sky and bring in the three valley foregrounds, December, April, and May. April was key because it was the first time that the river broke and there was nice water and it had the bonus reflection. So that's why I chose it. Um, and then so you need to blend that one sky with the three valleys, right? And then you go across to uh, blend winter, spring, and summer, then bring in the solar composites, make some final adjustments and crop. So those are the steps and I'll briefly show you how, to, how I did it. So here's the composite image without the solar arcs. And I you, I have, what I find over the years is that you have to deal with the sky separately than the, for, than the valley below or the foreground below because a good looking sky will yield, we could yield, can yield weird results in the foreground and a good looking foreground can yield uh, unde un undesirable banding in the skies. And I was trying to minimize the banding so that it looks more uh, a smoother blend. So the top half 
here we are uh, going to do it in, in the GIMP. Got layers on, got layers on the right, a toolbox in the middle, and your basic image. So this is that uh, uh, an example of the uh, December foreground image uh, in twilight. And so we put in a layer mask and apply a gradient with a custom uh, sunset defined uh, gradient tool that was provided by other another uh, GIMP user in a forum. Uh, and so you can see, you're, we're going to see most of the one, the left hand, one fifth of the panel blend in a little bit, and then the rest of it you're not going to see anymore because it just fades out. So when we superimpose that on the February um, picture, which is underneath the layer underneath, now you've blended the two. So now the uh, valley has changed, but we're ignoring that part because we're concentrating only on the sky. So now we're going to add another layer mask on this combined one. And now I want to bring in the May sky. Again, we're, you're going to see that much to the left, a blend in the middle, and then fade out to nothing on the right. And we combine that with the May image, which is in the layer underneath. There's the sky panel. So if you just look at the top half of this picture, that looks like the sky panel I showed you a couple of minutes ago. The bottom looks weird because you could look at you could see green and snow together, but pay no attention to that because I was mainly working with the skies. We're going to work with the lower half next. So what I did is I created some composites using that same top half sky panel with the three foreground images I wanted to use to represent winter, spring, and summer. Right. So here we are back in. There's the winter foreground with the same sky panel. There's the spring foreground, total spring in the foreground, identical sky panel, and summer foreground, identical sky panel. So now when we blend in the spring, uh, winter, spring, and summer um, foregrounds, that sky above the horizon isn't changing. So it doesn't matter how you blend, it's constant. And so we don't introduce any undesirable effects. So here it is. Here's the winter foreground with sky panel. Now, I'll go back a second. The river is kind of not going quite straight, and the valley kind of it kind of goes from bottom left up right a little bit in the perspective. It's not straight left to right. And so I found that I had to use a layer mask with a gradient that wasn't a horizontal, but at an angle. So there's, there's the angle. That's how, that's how much it's going to blend in of the winter river valley and just ignore the sky. Superimpose, there comes April all the way to the right in between the two. And you can see how the snow is changing to water in the middle because I used basically that to, to make sure that that snow didn't go change, uh, change from snow to water vertically, but at an angle, kind of following the, uh, the line of the river. Then you have to introduce another one. So I chose a different angle because of the bridge in the river valley. And now I'm going to blend this with the, the third and final foreground for summer. So there's the layer mask and the gradient blend. And now you have the summer foreground. That sky hasn't changed in any of these images that I've shown you because it was, it was layered in constant. So I, so I basically divided it at the horizon between sky and foreground. I haven't talked too much about the buildings, uh, the actual, um, the, 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 sky, uh, the sky, the sky, the, the building outlines. Um, I can say they're actually part of the, uh, part of the foreground processing, not the sky, but I didn't really deal. I just dealt with them, um, uh, in, in a slightly different manner, which I didn't include today because I was wanted to mainly concentrate on sky versus foreground. So here's one of the solar image composites. There, that's, that's the end result of the one I built in April. You can see the sunset arc and there's the reflections that were visible through the filter uh, on the water. They're dimmer, but they're there. And so I didn't expect them, I didn't realize they were gonna be there, but when I saw them, I thought, well, I have, they gotta be included. And that's why April was part of the foreground. So there's a series of these that you got to bring into a file where you've got your prepared foreground image and you have to bring in all seven, right? So December, January, February, March, April with the reflections, May and June. In the May and June, you can see some gaps uh, towards the bottom right, but that's, those are buildings that are covering up the sun for part of the set. So you have to bring in all of these layers and you can see they're all on the right and we're gonna combine them with, this for, with the prepared foreground. There's a lining going on, as I said, to take into account uh, differences, slight differences in uh, 
tripod and camera aiming uh, from each of the months. But because everything, you always had the horizon buildings and trees and other uh, objects to work with, you could always register these things uh, quite accurately to, to be faithful uh, to what the picture is trying to show. So this one also has some final adjustments where I brought in some building highlights and, uh, and, and things like that to, uh, to make sure that uh, they were well represented. And then uh, most people have widescreen monitors these days, also tablets and phone are typically widescreen. The camera shoots at 1.5 to one aspect ratio, but uh, I decided that the crop needed to be at 16 by nine because if you want to look at a full screen on your computer, then you get it, you get it, you get to see it without any borders. And that's, uh, to me, that's how they display the best. So there's the 16 by nine crop uh, in, in, uh, in GIMP. So I posted that uh, locally. Dave Robinson picked it up, showed it to the RASC Victoria folks, and I got an invite to present to you about how I did this photo. But I was quite tired of this picture at the time I got the invitation. So I told Reg, hey, I need some time away from this picture because I took it was a big it was a long slog to do this whole thing. So uh not gonna worry about it. Uh, maybe uh, for now, I'd like to not think about it for a while, maybe later. And Reg said, sure, that'd be great. Let me know when you're ready. Uh, I had submitted it to APOD as I, I, some of the better ones I do, I submit to APOD. And because uh, I had noticed over the years that the editors of APOD, they really like what's, they like the equinoxes and the solstices. They really like those. They always feature interesting images all the way back to Manhattan Henge, way back when that Neil deGrasse Tyson did uh, in Manhattan one year, which inspired me to do Edmonton Henge back in uh, 2016, which APOD did kindly did pick up. And there's the image on the right that I, cause I, they do like, they do like uh, skyscapes around those uh, parts of the earth's orbit. So I submitted the current one and it, and it happens four years to the day they selected it for APOD on September 22nd. They changed the name. Uh, they called it Equinox in the Sky. That's their call. Uh, and they added the annotations at the top, the south, west, and north markers. Uh, I hadn't bothered with those, uh, but uh, I think they felt, I didn't ask, but I think it seems to me they, they felt, I think they felt that uh, it was easier just to explain what, uh, what, what directions you're looking at uh, rather than having people figure it out from the blurb. And so that's the story. Uh, of this APOD. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Well, that was amazing, uh, Luca. Uh, I had no idea the amount of work that was in there. I suspected it was uh, an enormous amount, but uh, now that I know all of the techniques you use, uh, I'll even appreciate your image even more. So that's just wonderful. So thanks for preparing this for us. Uh, if, uh, uh, has anyone got a, a questions for Luca? How are you managing all that data? <laughs> well, compared to what, uh, it's actually not that much compared to what the deep sky and planetary imagers have to deal with. Uh, um, you just got to be organized. Um, keep everything, uh, yeah. I just uh, keep everything organized. Um, the pictures aren't aren't all that, uh, aren't all that big because they don't shoot in raw. So they're pretty manageable that way. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about the sheer volume, but the complexity. I mean, you have all the various components that go into the composite. Oh, well, you need a, well, you, as I, I had six months, like I had a, I, I thought about it for a few months and then I started in December and I knew I had six months to think about it. And so when I'm sitting at the park bench and the camera is taking all the pictures, that was mostly thinking about how I'm going to how I uh, how <clears throat> I would um, make this picture. Oh, and uh, I had also here's one of the thought processes was originally I thought well I had three panels before for uh, in the sunrise version. I'm gonna have seven sunset arcs here. Maybe I'll do a seven panel um, foreground to show the changes. But as I sat there in December, January and February and March, I realized, oh yeah, that's not gonna work. You're an idiot. It, that's all winter. 
It doesn't look any different. Other than the sky glow changing, the foreground doesn't look any different at all. So I realized that it, there'd be a lot more blending involved, might look weirder, uh, and we really wouldn't add because that left-hand side of the picture you can see here, it always looks like that for several months of the year. If uh, we lived in it where the climate changed more dramatically, uh, you could do it, but seven panels, uh, the more panels you do, the harder it is to do the blends. So um, I, as I sat there across the seven shoots, I, I basically thought about it and started sketching in my mind how it would go and then just making the set of notes because you need a plan. And as you process each image, you need to keep a log, just like an observing log, keep a processing log so that a month later when you go back, and do the next month, you can review what you did on the previous month. And I started, and I was building the image month by month because that informed how future decisions I would make. If I'd left everything till the end for full processing, I'd be still doing it right now. So that's why Edmonton gardeners uh, call it gardening in a refrigerator. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Luca, I was quite surprised that you didn't somehow try to register where your tripod was. But I guess it's not that critical, I guess. It's not that critical. It was also difficult uh, to do um, because I found this before. Um, where was it here? One of the big factors is this, right? You're sitting on snow, so, and that snow changes from month to month. And so even though I could leave indentations there, they wouldn't be there again. So it just wasn't, so I just, I just I basically pasted it off of the, of the park bench that's on the left hand side of this picture. I just pasted it off uh, and plunked it down. And then I always had a, re a reference images on and I compared the view through the viewfinder or the live view to make sure I was close enough. I'd done it before on the sunrise and I knew that no matter how hard you try, unless you can totally fix everything, you're not gonna be able to do it. And so you will get some registration issues, but they're very minor. Uh, and usually it's, a, it's usually lateral shifts that you have to do. And if the camera wasn't perfectly level every time, then a slight amount of rotation to keep that horizon straight. But otherwise, not that critical because it's a very, yeah, I guess, very wide I angle guess shot. I, I guess I, I, if I had thought about it, I, I think you're quite right because the, you're using such a wide angle, uh, little differences aren't going to make a lot of difference. Yeah, that's right. When I did the analemma, I built a custom wooden mount that would fit on a park bench that I knew wasn't going to move or, or, or was going to be easy to, because I thought I, I, did, I really didn't want to deal with uh, shifts in the solar position that much because they were, they turned out to be noticeable in test shots. So I built a custom mount that I could put on a park bench uh, with registration marks every time. And that all worked nicely for the, both the first three attempts. And then the fourth one, the city, the city changed the bench on me and that went all out the window. So even then I had, uh, I had uh, because I was starting over again, uh, I just rebuilt the I just rebuilt the mountain. Luke, I have a question. I used to live in Edmonton, so I know the air is dry there. Now that I'm out in Victoria, we have dew problems all the time. And I wonder, as you were getting toward evening, did you ever have dew on the lens? No, I never did. No, um, the 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 solar filter was in front. I don't know if that helped or not. Uh, it was, dew was actually never a problem uh, in that regard, even in March and April. I think it might be out here, but... Uh, Probably. Yeah. I know for Alistair on doing uh, Aurora and things like that, he quite often has his running dew heaters all night. Uh, but this always started uh, one to three hours before sunset. So mm -hmm. um, no, it, didn't, it ended up being, not being a problem. The problem, the biggest problem was, uh, was the cloudy days. Luke, 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 what was the longest duration of a shoot? The longest duration of which? Of a, of a shoot, like when you went out to do a sequence, how long, what was the longest time? Uh, it was about three, uh, three hours, hmm. but I had every, to arrive every, early. Shot every, shot every 10 seconds. Yeah. 
Yeah. Really most of the show, most of the most of the, most of those images though are very tiny because it's all black except for a single small circle of the sun, right? So they're not very large JPEGs. They're about 1.5 meg a piece. Right. There's hardly anything there. <laughs> uh, well, congratulations on the result, Luca. It's very beautiful. Amazing. Thank you very much. Amazing. Very Did you well play it? Did you play at all with the uh, exposure of the sun? Yeah, I know you changed it like three times, but did you have to balance the exposures to get them to look the same? Well, I wanted to make, well, I did, I did want the lower ones to be slightly dimmer. And if they got more orange, I wanted that color to, to remain in. But for the most part, um, I didn't, I didn't adjust them. I didn't, I didn't really, uh, the only, uh, every once in a while there was a thin cloud and I got the solar image I needed at the five minute interval, but it was so dim, it would look like a gap. So those I, I boosted so that you could, uh, you could see it was there. And if you look really closely at the high resolution uh, images, you can see that some of them, it's not as crisp. The, the solar disk is not as crisp as others. But when you look at the entire image, those circles are so small that it, it really doesn't matter. But yeah, every once in a while, the solar image was there, but it was pretty fuzzy and pretty faint. I had to bring those up for the, for the passing cloud problems. Did you see but any most of the time, funny shapes down at the horizon, refractions, atmospheric refractions? You do, yeah, but you have to really blow up the image to see them. Yeah, and the, the, lens, the lens is a stock lens. It's not apochromatic, so there's chromatic aberration in the lens too, especially at the, at the lower when the sun is getting much more orange. Uh, and even the horizon pictures, uh, the, the twilight pictures of the foreground have a little bit of chromatic. When you, when, when you zoom in, you can see it a lot, right? Um, uh, but they, they more or less disappear when you look at it uh, as a skyscape image. So there, there's advantages of shooting wide, <laughs> but you, you still got to take a fraction of the sun's position as it got near the horizon. Any change in this predicted position? I, I, I didn't notice anything. Um, it all, it, uh, there were differences between where I predicted it was going to be uh, in the te in the reference image, but that's just because I was approximating things you, you, through the photo ephemeris. I never had pictures across that time period before, so now I now I know exactly where the sun sets from that location for those six months because I have it for all of them. But uh, the refraction I don't think changed it all that much. It was quite surprising to curve the pathway the path the sun's pathway. Right. Um, I didn't talk I didn't talk a lot about it, but um, the um, I did find on the sunrise one, because I kept the, the aiming point fixed for all three, there were uh, these wide angle lenses tend to distort the shape of the sun and, and the shape of the image uh, on the left and right. They're most accurate in the middle. So on this one, I always made sure I was shooting the sun where the, most of the arc was in the middle of the frame to minimize lens distortions. And so to make sure that what you do see in the end in terms of curvature or angle or shape of the solar disk is that has the least amount of lens distortion that I can manage at 10 millimeters. And then the foregrounds, I, uh, I did uh, similarly, uh, sometimes with different camera position and then layered them all and registered them. Because I wanted to make sure that you didn't see elliptical suns that would be distracting. Um, and I wanted, I didn't want any curvatures to make you think that it's the lens causing those things. So all in all, uh, with a 10 millimeter um, in the middle of the frame, and those are, those are pretty accurate uh, to, uh, to the actual arcs and the spacing of the arcs and the shape of the sun. Actually, I wasn't implying anything. I was just amazed they were curved. I, I, I assumed that you'd done all that stuff already. Well yeah, uh, but it, it, I learned a lot on the sunrise one um, because I, in the sunrise one, I never changed it. I never shifted the camera position and I realized, hmm, I think some of the, some, some of the, a little bit of, uh, there's some artifacts in there that aren't really part of the uh, dynamics. They're really part of the lens. So I tried to minimize that on this one. Trying to be very, very precise on such a thing where you have, even though you're plunking a, ca a tripod down on snow, right? But if, I think if you uh, if you try to keep track of all the little details, uh, at least uh, you have a, a faithful representation of the scene. 
Well, thanks so much, Luca. That was amazing. Um, I, normally, if we were in our normal meeting uh, hall, we would give a rousing applause. And I, I ask people to, uh, <laughs> to <laughs> use the reactions on the screen, if you can, and uh, <laughs> put your hands together. And I see hand clapping, and I see yeah. thumbs up, and I see actual hands clapping. Thank yeah. you very much. So, so thank you very much. And, and normally, we would also come out and to present you with a coveted uh, beer glass. And oh. I'll get your address and send one your way uh, in thanks and appreciation, because you've obviously put an awful lot of effort into this wonderful presentation. And we do appreciate that and, and congratulate you. You must have been very satisfied to have it uh, show up as a astronomy picture of the day. I, I would think that that would have been a, a good day for you. I was very, very satisfied. In fact, uh, I submitted it on June, June 20, I don't know, shortly after June 21st, after uh, a few days of process, uh, finally processing it. And they don't actually, the APOD never, they don't say anything until they've accepted it. And so three days before September 22, one of the editors sent me this email with the link, a preview link. <laughs> and that's how I found out. <laughs> they just, uh, they, they, they'll just, if they select it, they select it. And if they don't, they don't say anything because I guess they get too many submissions per day. So it was, uh, it was good. It was good. Well, so then I had to wait three. So then I couldn't say anything for three days because the, the RASC Edmonton center needed to be surprised. Right. Excellent. Well, listen, um, the, the one thing that since Dave has joined the crew, um, I'm no more familiar with the Edmonton skyline than the Victoria skyline now. And, and I think this is just proof that the Edmonton Center's mission for world domination is well on track. And uh, so at, at any rate, so there, there you go. Um, I think that the next thing we will do is I'll just quickly go over some of the things that are uh, uh, were submitted uh, this week for our Astro Cafe web. And then we might have time for David Lee to give some uh, some observations about his uh, his thoughts on uh, uh, the um, what 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 was it, David? It was electronic outreach. Uh, actually, it's electronically assisted astronomy. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. So I'll just try and go here, and I'll share. And I'll get rid of this. And so this is the web page for uh, uh, October 5th. And the first picture I wanted to share is John's picture of September 30th. And uh, this is just stunning detail. John, did you want to make any comments on this one? Thanks, Rich. Just uh, that I'm, I'm pleased with that. I'm still learning how to how to do this, uh, but uh, I think today is probably the uh, closest approach for Mars. And so I'm trying to get as much data as I can, you know, right around this, uh, this time. And at the same time, I'm trying to learn how to process. And uh, I think I'm getting a little better at it as I go. All right. I, I think the results are amazing, John. Thanks very much for that. And uh, it'll be, uh, hopefully you'll get uh, more pictures for the sequence and the rotation. Um, uh, we've got uh, Abdur Anwar from Edmonton also doing the same thing. His shot is fairly similar, but if you go back and forth, you can see the motion. Yours is on September 30th. He never gave a date for when his was done, but you can see the same features. And his ice cap has got a little bit more details, but a little bit blurring on the edges. I, I don't know, it's interesting. Uh, it would be fun to get together and explore, share techniques uh, with the two clubs on, on the planetary imaging sometime. Uh, so that, that is a great one from Abdur. He's got a whole sequence and, and both John and, uh, and uh, Abdur have got uh, Celestron Edge SCTs. John's is an eight inch and Abdur's is uh, uh, an 11 inch. And they use slightly different cameras and things like that. And uh, it seems that Abdur takes a lot more pictures so uh, and a lot more images. But uh, 
it's uh, really quite quite exciting stuff here. And uh, as as John mentioned, that uh, uh, I guess the six is the uh, closest uh, approach or, uh, to Mars, and the thirteenth is the actual opposition of Mars. So uh, this is the perfect time to do it. And it's so nice that we don't have a dust storm. Let's hope those forest fires in California behave themselves and you can get some bags some more photons, John. So that's that. Now, Alistair uh, sent a, a beautiful thing here and if I'm going to try and see if this works. So I'll click this and see if you can hear this, uh, see and hear this. Are people seeing this? Yeah. yeah. Like the handle of the Big Dipper. Okay, so I'll just go back. So that was from uh, Alistair and uh, I, I hope uh, that Luca, you'll, you'll tell Alistair how much we enjoyed his stuff. And, and it's really important to have the sound on that one. It really adds another dimension to the whole experience. It's just great. I will mention it to him. Yeah. And uh, then uh, Jim Hesser uh, mentioned that he captured, uh, caught a very, uh, interesting lecture on gravitational waves that he said was dynamic, quite accept, accessible, and right up to date. And there's it's just a click away uh, on the, your YouTube channel there. And there's another thing coming up. Uh, there's been a whole pile of series uh, of golden webinars in astrophysics. Um, and this is the latest in the series is coming up. And it's on the challenges of the asteroid sample return mission. Uh, that is going to be discussed uh, from uh, this gentleman is from uh, uh, JAXA, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. So that'll be interesting. And that's coming up on October 9th. Uh, this is in Chilean local time. And this is talk will be given in English. So uh, uh, just click on here if you want to register for it. And so that sounds pretty good. And I'll just click over here as to this thing that uh, what's happening at the RC, RASC, and basically everything is uh, dominated by a whole pile of activities involving Mars, which isn't a surprise. Um, uh, the Insider's Guide to Galaxy has a Mars Fest. So the Sunshine Coast has got a meeting uh, this, this uh, week, and it's on a large scale structure of the universe, and you can click there to, uh, uh, to join in. And uh, we also have uh, a thing called Mars Madness uh, going on in Toronto. So they're really winding things up there. And an opposition party on the 13th. Uh, this is not a political event, but uh, it looks pretty good. And uh, so all sorts of plenty of things there. So you can have a toxic uh, exposure to Mars if you don't watch out, if you go on to all of these things. So it, a, a lot of tremendous topics. Uh, uh, being listed. So check out this uh, what's happening at the RASC. It's a very rich resource for us to find out what we can see. And this is spread over two weeks this period because we do not have, uh, uh, they are not going to be sending one out for the Thanksgiving weekend. And also I should mention that this time we will not be holding an Astro Cafe on the uh, this weekend as well. So um, uh, the long Thanksgiving weekend. 
So I think that's about it from me. I'll stop the share and turn it over to David Lee. Just, just before you go, Reg, uh, tomorrow morning, my wife and I are going to be joining a webinar from the University of Alberta put on by Chris Hurd, who is a geologist and has done, he's the guy that's going to select the samples that they're going to pick and leave behind for future return. So I'm looking forward to that and I hope to have some information on that uh, next time. Well, it sounds great. Thanks uh, for reminding us, Dave. Hey, th thanks, Reg. Um, I just wanted to comment on a few things. Uh, Bill Weir sent on my name to a group of people within National. Uh, they're actually exploring electronically assisted astronomy. Now, I, just for a quick definition, um, it's just basically astronomy where you're not necessarily just using your eyes. It's kind of, um, I guess, a hybrid between uh, visual and uh, photography. Uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago, there was some interest in using uh, video intensifiers and uh, video cameras to sort of uh, have kind of near real time uh, accumulation of light. So um, I think the debate was whether or not this was time for us to see where EAA might fit within the context of RASC. Uh, we have a lot of uh, certificate programs that have to do with uh, visual observing and uh, as well as uh, astrophotography, but this seems to be kind of um, a hybrid uh, where we weren't quite sure where it actually fit in. Uh, there's implications definitely for uh, the observing certificates uh, where I think already there seems to be some uh, potential disagreement about whether or not um, uh, observing using uh, photography is is valid or not, but with the uh, the encroaching problems with light pollution in cities, I think uh, it would seem to me that it's probably still valid to um, to allow for technology to help us uh, do observing any way we can. So in some ways, I think as long as you're not hiding the fact that you're using technology, I I think more stuff in our toolkit the better. So we've started to talk about that. Uh, we were debating whether or not we need a committee to do this, uh, but it sounds like we might want to just start off just having a user group, an interest group that uh, maybe discusses how we might use this. Um, originally before COVID uh, came, came up uh, early this year, I had actually anticipated that we might try this up at the center of the universe during the summer. So I was already kind of keen on maybe, maybe doing this. Uh, so, anyways, uh, there there was also some discussion about whether or not this should be led by individuals within the society, or whether we, we should be very active and sort of uh, engaging uh, many centers that were interested in helping them get started, uh, maybe using some of the technology. So that's actually where we're at. Uh, we're not very much further along. Uh, I plan to do something here within Victoria Center for sure. Uh, just to um, see what kind of observing enhancements we can use uh, in the context of our own observing. I, I think there are probably a lot of times when we pass up things because we don't have perfect skies and um, photography in general and perhaps EAA might have uh, some effect in terms of our interest or maintaining our interest uh, while we can't necessarily get away to really dark spots. Um, does anybody have any questions about what the initiative is about? How, how many people were in the uh, committee you talked? There's uh, there's seven of, seven of us. I don't know exactly where everybody is from. I think some people are from Winnipeg. Uh, I think uh, Blair, uh, who I got the original message from, is from Prince George. Uh, yeah, a fair number. It's some people from Toronto as well. Uh, apparently, people are already doing this. Uh, uh, there's a number of centers that are already taking advantage of EAA in the form of live streaming. And I think uh, Lori probably alluded to that uh, early in this meeting, but that's becoming part of the nature of society now with COVID is that um, uh, people are starting to take advantage of live streaming as a way of, um, uh, well, it's still engaging people. I mean, we, we don't necessarily have to get together physically, but we can 
still enjoy some of the aspect of uh, community viewing. Well, thanks for taking, uh, 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 keeping in touch with that group and please keep us uh, apprised of developments, uh, David. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, well, well, David, that's why I put your name forward because I knew you were planning on doing it up at the CU and I knew that Blair was already doing it. Like their center right. already on their public outreach. They just set up a Malin cam with their SAT and show people mm -hmm. stuff on screens instead of people waiting in long lines at eyepieces and then mm -hmm. wait a second while I nudge the scope kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, yeah. there's another aspect of this, which I didn't mention, which I'll mention right now. Uh, Jay, who's uh, one of the members of the group, uh, he just purchased uh, something called EV scope. And I don't know whether people have seen or heard about it, but I think there was a write up in uh, the sky at night, the, the BBC magazine about it. And it's basically uh, the essence of that particular scope is it's meant to be used by anybody without any technical experience. It's one of these uh, instruments where you kind of set it up and it's its own bearing. Um, and it basically it is kind of like a camera that's basically able to point at different areas of the sky and show you imagery uh, through digital backing. So I don't know if anybody's heard of EV. I, I just had a look at it. If you just Google EV scope, uh, you'll see some quick uh, videos of it. Um, somehow SETI is involved in it as well. The, they're like co-sponsors. Cool. Okay. Very good. Is there anybody else has anything else to uh, uh, add to tonight? Uh, it's Lori's item. Oh, oh yes. yes. Sorry, Lori. Hi. I'm back on here. Um, uh, so, um, what I, I just wanted to check in that on October the 17th, which is a week from Saturday night, um, the uh, friends of the DAO are going to be having our uh, next virtual star party and that we are going to be having Luke Simard who's the director general of the of the HAA um, and is going to be talking on um, some of the some like the next 10 years of um, of what's happening with the with the center and with uh, with um, uh, I guess astrophysics in general in Canada and so he's going. He's going to be presenting that for us. Um, so uh, this is our is also going to be our annual general meeting. We have, you know, everybody <laughs> has to have one of these, and so we're going to have to have that. And because uh, in this time of COVID um, and what's happening with the charitable organizations, um, we have to have a registration for this meeting because we need to know who's voting and who's not. You'll be certainly able to come into the meeting. Um, uh, we'd love to have everybody there. If you're not a member of the FDAO, then you won't be able to vote um, um, at the meeting, but uh, that would just make it so that possibly you might want to become a member of the, <laughs> of the FDAO and help us out for sure. I mean, right now we're making absolutely zero in any, in any um, um, of our of our donations and things like that because we've been closed all year. So um, anything would help, but we are going to be having that meeting. It will only be maybe 15 minutes or so if we just have to go through the formalities of it. But uh, we're looking forward to having Luke Simard speak to us next. So that'll be Saturday, the Saturday, October the 17th. And I can put in, um, I can maybe give onto the website, Reg, I can give you the, the, the different, the, like the, the link for registering registering for the meeting, or people can just simply go to the FDAO website to register. As well. I I think we should have both strategies. So when you have the stuff available, please send it my way, and I'd be happy to put it on our website. I will. Yeah, I guess, and because we're not going to be around next uh, next Monday, I can't kind of put um, um put a, a little um, um uh, nudge in for that as well. But that's okay. We can put it on our website too. So. So we hope people will come. Thank you. Okay. Well, very much. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, for coming tonight. And uh, uh, once again, Luca, thanks so much for your uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, everyone, have a great Thanksgiving. And we'll uh, gather around here in two weeks from now. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody.
Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Edge.